going um hang out. Cool. Right. Hi everyone, how's it going? Good. Good. Welcome to Open Hour. Um, so this month we are talking about classifying waste um, and waste streams and all the types of different waste that we deal with that's I feel like different everywhere. Um, so this topic, is, it came about from a number of, of different places. I sat in on this really cool webinar um, from Earthworks, and hopefully they'll be joining us here in a little bit and talk a little bit about um, some of their waste stream questions and concern. Um, but this, I mean, it spans everything from wastewater um, to recycling and the way that we handle, you know, composting and from production of waste down to the end of what, what do we finally end up doing with it. Um, and, and the ways that we talk about it um, in, in different places might be different in terms of sometimes it's hazardous or sometimes it's not. And, and sometimes that can just be um, who, um, who's the one who's directing the waste stream. So that's, I mean, it's kind of a general introduction. I think a couple people on here have some other experience and questions um, with waste streams, um, and I'd love to chat about it. Does somebody want to kick it off with a, a question or a topic? Or should we, should we do intros? Do we want to know who's in the room? Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, let's start with a little bit of intros. Let's, um, there are a number of us, let's do your name. Uh, where are you calling in from? And one word that that um, got you excited, got you excited for the call on uh, on this topic. Do let's start with um, the Boston group. <laughs> um, hi, Jeff here. Various members of Parts and Crafts milling in the background. Uh, good to see you all. That's Bryce. Uh, <laughs> that's Shiloh underneath there. He's he's wrapped because of the pizza, um, and uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. Word, can you, give, can you give me a little time? You just your name, where you're calling in from, and one word. <laughs> no time. Pizza. <laughs> you put me on the spot here. It's very difficult to come up with one good word. <laughs> All right, uh, we can go. Um, this room is um, uh, I'm from New Orleans. Um, I'm Stevie. Samantha. Um, and what's what's our word? Do we have also a connect. Connect. connect is our word. Yes, because I like the idea of bringing information to people and getting them uh, talking to each other. Five o'clock here. Um, one word: uh, biodegradable. <laughs> Ooh, cool, Sarah. Oh, hey. I'm calling from a little town called Valverde in Los Angeles County, and uh, ooh, how about frugal as the word? Okay, cool. The opposite of waste. <laughs> awesome. Hi, Sam. How's it going? <laughs> Good. Do you guys 
want to say who you are and uh, where you're calling in from and one word that, that brought you to the call? Um, yeah, I'm Shan and uh, my friend and colleague, Lion, and uh, um, we're in Guangzhou in Renovation Hub's office in Guangzhou. And uh, we're calling to, uh, to learning from to learn from everybody. <laughs> Great, um, Gretchen. Hi, I'm Gretchen. Um, I'm calling from Durham, North Carolina, and I would say that it's gonna be a hyphenated word: crazy waste regulations. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where's the hyphen on that, though? <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike, how's it going? Are you able to talk? Uh, no, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. I'm calling from Los Angeles. Uh, I'm a civic technologist, and I work in a local government here in LA, LA City. And I guess one word I can describe, it's not hyphenate, it's actually two words, it's everyday urbanism. And so I, it's a term I use, it's from Margaret Crawford, and I'm a big proponent of bottom-up strategies. So I'm interested in learning what to hear, you know, what's being discussed. Awesome, thanks Mike. Um, Hamlo, are you able to go off mute? Oh, sorry, I don't have the comments open. Um, hello, hi. Oh, okay, everyone with Pablo is asleep. That's great, that's cool. We can follow you on comments, Pablo, thanks. Pablo is in Silbao, and his word is waste love. Waste <laughs> Thanks, Pablo. Um, okay, and then we have somebody calling in on a phone. Hi, um, my name's Nadia Steinzer, and I work for an organization called Earthworks on oil and gas issues, and we've looked a lot into the waste stream from that sector, and I guess this may not be the most positive message, but I would like to see more polluter pays concepts. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Um, does somebody have like a, a question or a statement or something interesting about the topic that they want to kick it off with? I, you know, I might. And there's, so just briefly, just say your name again before you. Okay. Uh, Sarah Sage. Um, one of the things um, that I've encountered with um, Southern California's waste classification system or the statewide system is that it really, um, it has the unintended or maybe intended effect of um, hiding where things go. So the, it's, it's trying to help us find a, a better idea of how the waste stream is operating, what goes where. But in, at least in my experience, it's because there's so many re regulations, it's made it a lot harder, at least where I live, to actually track that down, if that makes sense. So more regulation in some ways makes it a little less accountable, if that makes sense. Does that make sense or no? Can you give an example? Um, okay, for instance, um, let's talk a uh, certain types of like uh, alternative daily cover is reported differently by uh, one municipality versus another. So there's not really a standardized, I guess that's the word I'm looking for. It's not very standardized. So um, a lot of the numbers that you find are um, not complete for one municipality versus another, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Because um, I guess, yeah, anyway, that's enough for me. <laughs> So, Sarah, is this a position that's basically like regulation equals loophole? Oh, yes. This is, yeah, thank you. That's exactly what, yes, exactly. So, one of the things in California that is allowed is that 75% of the waste, um, they have a 75% initiative. So um, whatever landfill is permitted 
like if they're permitted to accept 10,000 tons per day, they can also accept 7,500 tons per day of some a classification called um, uh, alternative daily cover. They call it beneficial reuse. So that can be anything from shredded cars to clean soil to green waste, um, just lots of different undesirable things that just basically add to the waste burden. Um, so that's my example. The, that loophole directly burdens my community. So um, as an example. <laughs> I don't think we can talk about waste without talking about consumption patterns and changing consumption patterns. So we generate six pounds of waste per day in packaging roughly now. It used to be a pound per person per day. And really what's dramatically changed is not so much the industry, but consumer patterns and wealth. And so a lot of the waste classification systems are going to have to get right into the marketing of producers and also the consumption of producers. And one example is today Whole Foods announced in my neighborhood that they're going to be marketing uh, ugly greens. So they grow their salads on a rooftop garden and a certain percentage of those salads have defects. So they generally people don't want to buy them and therefore they go into the waste organic waste. So part of the effort is to change the classification of a product before it even becomes waste. And in this case, the blemished salad is uh, sold at 50%. So I think a lot of the definitions of waste are very fluid. They really have to do with cultural perceptions of what a product is and what a disposable item is. Mm -hmm. That's, that's something that's for consumer waste. And one of the things that just I've, since I've been going through um, tonnage reports for like the last couple of years is that, you know, we, we often try to teach children about how not to waste. And really, when you look at tonnage reports, most of the waste comes from other industries. And that presents a huge advocacy challenge for, um, you know, somebody just like me, um, who wants to advocate for responsible waste or responsible consumption, but um, they're not, uh, this is not my arena. Does that make sense? This is not something that I can do unless I know how to advocate um, on that type of level, which means uh, going against industries who it, it's cheaper for them to to continue doing things the way that they do so um, I, Yeah, I don't know how involved this will get but like in where we live they everything is is divided beside you know between hazardous non hazardous hazardous there's uh, inert there's uh, you know anything that's wet um is in a different classification there's medical waste i mean there's so many classifications where i live that makes it so muddy to understand where waste is going how much gasoline how many fossil fuels are being generated as a result of moving waste from one place to another because of the waste classification system so those are kind of the things that i'm thinking about like in terms of how we classify things is is uh, is just creating so many loopholes for for industries to actually profit. Uh, Nadia, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about waste classification from like the worker standpoint and some of the things that you've seen in the work that you do. Yeah, thanks. And I was um, actually just thinking how you know the, there are similarities across the board in terms of of you know the loopholes and the the really murky kind of definitions of waste and I mean in at Earthworks and I should have said earlier I'm based in New York um, but we work around the country and so in our review of oil and gas waste specifically part of the problem is that the waste isn't actually tested and characterized so that what may look like you know there's all these classifications and they don't make sense 
at least in the oil and gas perspective, the problem is is that like prior to disposal at a landfill, for example, the waste isn't actually tested to see what it what it contains so that it can be slotted into proper disposal. So then you end up with all sorts of you know radioactive waste potentially going into landfills. Um, you know the the drill cuttings that contain heavy metals and toxic chemicals getting mixed with ash or um, sawdust so that it can go into a landfill. So I think that that's part of the problem is it's not, you know, from our perspective, we don't see it so much as a problem of regulation or regulatory loopholes. It's usually weak, unclear regulation, and then enforcement is the real problem. So I'd be curious from other folks working on other types of ways whether you, you see it as a problem of you know, the environmental impacts of this waste being a, an outcome of having weak regulation or is it weak oversight? Because, I mean, from our perspective, we think it's, you know, a little bit of both. That you just don't have, you know, the waste disposal facilities, you don't have regulators kind of following through and making sure that those loopholes aren't unduly exploited. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that is is placed in Chiquita, for instance, is um, drill cuttings are a really big one, but those are classified mm -hmm. as part of um, any, especially oil contaminated soils. Those are all content. Those are all classified. These are nasty things as beneficial reuse. So those are part of the right. seventy five percent that doesn't get counted on a permit. So when the land use issue comes up and you're trying to fight um you know a permitting or an expansion of a waste facility you um these i guess maybe a loophole may not be the right word it, it's like you you hear a word like that and the average person is i'm coming at this from an advocate standpoint um you think that um you know, in, in your mind, you're thinking, oh, beneficial reuse. And it literally, uh, to me, it's uh, that 75%, that, to me, that is such a huge loophole. And um, I don't know, uh, other states have that type of um, uh, regulation uh, set up. Um, but I, I know uh, Oregon and Nevada nearby do not do that. So um, I don't know if, if you're aware of other uh, places that allow for that type of uh, special waste classification. Do you mean beneficial reuse? Yeah. As, yeah, I think all states do it because it's a way to get rid of waste. Um, you know, I was on a call earlier today about waste water, not solid waste, um, but that you know, if you can show that you're going to use it for different products, in this case, you know, spreading it on roads as a de-icer because oil and gas waste is highly saline, um, that, that then you can spread it on roads. So that, you know, is another concern. I think all states do that. And again, it's a question of, you know, that may have been a good idea at the time um, for, and it was certain types of waste that folks had in, that the regulators who put that in had in mind about beneficial reuse. Um, you know, for example, um, and you all probably know this, but like, you know, the use of old tires and playground equipment um, was a good idea at the time, right? It helped us deal with tires or, you know, making press board out of, out of um, lumberyard remnants. Those are all good ideas, but then when it gets applied, across the board to, you know, then you have like contaminated products that are being just given a blanket exemption to be used in other situations without any real consideration for, for their effects. And to me, that's the real loophole is that they're not, you know, there isn't proper oversight and they're not properly tested and considered. And it's just as like, like you said, you know, the public here is beneficial reuse. Well, who could argue with that? Yeah, um, Boston, you, you wrote in. Do you want to comment? 
Oh, I wasn't sure. Uh, I was hoping another staff member might have recalled that, that um, the details of that. I only have the, the sketchiest memory of it. Yeah, so Jeff, for those who can't see, wrote in that there was a like questioning if there was a report um, of water being used of, um, to irrigate in California. So I definitely heard that um, they're using um, fracking water to, for irrigation. Um, there. Wow, that's disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's really disgusting. I, I haven't, um, I, I don't know if there's a report out, but it's one of those issues where, like, hello, could we test the stuff and maybe do a little pilot project first before making it a, across the board? Um, if folks want to know more about that, um, I think Clean Water Action in California has a lot of information on it um, right. because it is something that came up and you know, the problem is like, you know, farmers need water and the oil and gas company, well, in this case, oil companies need to get rid of their waste. Um, so it, uh, it just becomes really popular right away. Hmm. One thing I wonder, like the, the link here that Matthew sent makes a lot of sense that it's used for road de-icing because like frack flow back water um, is, is really briny like it's really really salty um which wouldn't make sense for irrigation that'd be like it's, it's actually much more briny than your typical salt water like seawater so um that's really interesting to hear about i wonder why they yeah I'm, I'm, sure they, I'm sure they treat it in some way probably for the irrigation they're looking to desalinate it but again in california it would from oil and I'm not, sh I mean, cause there's, there'd be from oil drilling and I'm not sure what the constituents are of that waste, but surely it would require a lot of treatment to not have the toxic chemicals that are used in all forms of drilling. Um, so yeah, and, and even with the road spreading, like the brininess helps and makes sense as a product, but if they don't treat it properly and take out all the other uh, stuff that's in there, um, that's when it becomes a real concern, like runoff for vegetation and, and animal health. Yeah, definitely. And eventually, well, even well water and stuff. So I think that that's the main concern with the irrigation thing is, are they treating it properly and has all the, have all the toxins been taken out? And, um, you know, I don't think that, that it's I don't think it's totally clear yet, which is part of the problem, but it's also unlikely that they're doing it. not to be too cynical or anything. But. <laughs> um, I, but was I, I, would, I was just curious to ask back somebody else. Somebody said earlier that the main issue with all waste is consumption and I'm always interested in that question too, even from an oil and gas perspective, like it comes to changing our consumption habits and, you know, reducing the market and then you'd reduce the waste. And I was, I was just curious if folks had any thoughts on that of like good strategies to persuade folks that, you know, waste is, it's always an afterthought. It doesn't just for oil and gas, but like all waste, it's always an afterthought when we buy products. So how can we get that more front and center? Uh, it's an afterthought because we subsidize the disposal of waste, which is a really new process. You know, like municipal trash pickup for the most part is a post-World War II uh, phenomenon in the United States and grew with the plastics industry um, and the plastics disposable packaging industry. So in terms of it being a consumption issue, it is in some, on some level a consumption issue, but you know, the head of the United States Plastics Council in the 50s had famously said, you know, the future of our industry is in the trash can. Um, and <laughs> the, the goal being to expand the opportunities for thoughtless disposal of cheap plastic packaging items. Um, in places that I've seen reduced waste around, uh, especially food packaging waste, generally has to do with uh, mandating 
packaging take back at supermarkets rather than doing municipal subs subsidies to essentially dispose of um, uh, non-biodegradable um, <laughs> refuse. So Switzerland runs an interesting project where, where uh, all, all bottles have a fairly substantial um, deposit on them like they do in the United States, but there's no municipal pickup for them. They just force everyone to take mm -hmm. everything back to supermarkets. So it ends up being you get groceries from the supermarket, you have to bring containers back. And I have seen, when I was there, I did see a, a, a slight increase in people bringing their own containers to the store and things like that, because suddenly the stores were incentivized because they had to now capture the cost of, of, of consumer wastes. Mm -hmm. Mike, can you tell us about you know, this? Oops, sorry, go ahead. No, I didn't want to monopolize this. I just wanted to ask a follow-up question on that, because I've been told sometimes that, like, you can't do that in a lot of situations, bring your own container because of health codes and sanitary codes. And I was just curious if you know how the organizations or the businesses that you're talking about get around that. I'm not exactly sure. Here in Oregon, you're allowed to bring your own containers for bulk goods. Um, I know it's mm -hmm. illegal to use recycled or reused plastics in food service. So mm -hmm. you can't for allergy reasons because plastics are somewhat permeable. So if someone, if you used like a bucket of yogurt to hold another food and then someone ate it, they were allergic. If they were deathly allergic to milk products, there's a chance they'd die because certain proteins from the milk would have gotten trapped in the plastic matrix. So there are different rules like that. But I believe bringing your own container, <laughs> there aren't really any rules against that. It, there may be rules against someone else handling that container though. Okay, thanks. Um, Mike, I was wondering if you could ping in and tell us a little bit about this link you dropped on the chat. Okay, sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> um, I, I thought about like, you know, when, the, you know, it's an interesting question, like, you know, how do we rethink of like culture change and culture shift, especially how, how people think of what the concept of what it means to be zero waste. And um, City Lab did a really interesting case study about this one small town. You might've seen it on, on Facebook feeds from coming to Japan, where it's tried to be one of the first villages to turn as declared as an official zero waste city. And one of the things that I was really struck back was of how colossal the effort it was in this small town of just only 1700 people where they have over 34 classifications of waste. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key thing is that how do you get the people to buy in that, you know, it's like, you know, 20 years ago, the communication was, you know, we have to recycle plastics. <laughs> it's a bad thing. And so it is standard to see in any office across the country to see like a blue bin. Now, the change in tide in the conversation is, is like scaring some people is that, you know, we actually have to do more because, you know, just putting it in the blue bin is not enough. And so I think it's like the next step is like, you know, how do you have sort of a regional eco economy that sees the benefit, especially making more classifications to getting investing classifications because I, the one thing that I got taken away with this example from Japan was sort of the senior citizen employment. Um, that sort of was involved. It wasn't really people that you would think like in regular uniforms and like, you know, it was discussed earlier, like the 20th century model of like people coming around sanitation trucks. No, it was sort of people even in the, like from home to the place that they had the centers. They really sort of leave, lived and breathe this idea of like to embrace all these classifications. And to me, you know, that goes back to culture change and sort of thinking of like when you think of it like, you know, initiatives is always sort of this engineering and enforcement but the education and sort of communication part is like a is sort of like the hardest thing to tackle because it's like how do you kind of focus that message and I'm seeing I'm hearing a few sort of ideas and I'm curious for everyone to think about like you know is there anything do you think of value when you think of like learning about open data in terms of like you know is that, a, is that a step in the right direction to hear of like how cities are reporting on e-waste sort of pickups and like, you know, in the city of LA, we're trying it for the last four years in our open data movement and it's kind of had mixed results. One of the things is that people have sort of been aware of is that the way we use the title of refuse water is sort of way broad and, and you know, this was brought up earlier. And so I'm kind of curious from, 
you know, from the panel and from everyone participating is like, where do you, how do you think like we can get to that point where you can have the culture change and like, you know, the example like in Kamasu Japan, which is not again for everybody, but like, how do you kind of get people on board with sort of a, a regional economy connect to the idea of getting beyond more than simple classifications? If that wasn't a mumble, I apologize. <laughs> I can clarify my question. <laughs> Hmm. Shannon Lyon, um, I was wondering if you could help give us a perspective a little bit about some of the, maybe that, like that comment or specifically some of the things that you're seeing in China uh, related to waste and waste management and, and how people are, are dealing with it there. Um, I, I, we are still trying to catch everybody. You know, topic. But our main concern is uh, also why we are doing this uh, meeting is uh, last year we are doing research on the medical waste, on antibiotics waste. So in China, a lot of uh, antibiotics waste are used to uh, to to use as fertilizer. Uh, to use as organic fertilizers because the antibiotics waste they're made of corn they're made of yeah so they are very nutrient so um, but um, uh, as we can see that if we ask uh, so uh, so the first we are problem is how to do advocacy but then we find if we want the, the industry to recycle their waste, it put a lot of money on it. And uh, because the, the, Chinese, the Chinese industry, they, uh, they, are, they, are, they are, are very little. I mean, because they are making the antibiotics raw material. So the very first steps. So if they adapt some high tech technique to recycle those waste, it will break them down. So, uh, so they won't, so they cannot, reuse that they, they just directly sell the waste to use it to fertilizer so um it's very 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 hard to do advocacy to to let them uh, deal with the waste properly uh, i don't know if i put myself clearly yeah anyway and uh, and also these days there are a very famous chinese a film, I, I just tap it here, it's about uh, a plastic waste and the global waste uh, come into China and uh, cause uh, a big healthy issues to, uh, to the Chinese rural villagers. And um, yeah, so it, it's also a, a problem. So uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, John, I you know you, you can't speak, but I was thinking a little bit about um, some of the resource that you and your group have done. And I was wondering if you could maybe drop in a couple links if you have some in terms of the ways people think about waste and, um, and the work that you guys have done. Um, we didn't do a lot of advocacy on, on waste. Because <laughs> Sorry, Shannon, I meant uh, Pablo. I, would, I didn't mean it. <laughs> And I know he can't, he can't talk. He has people sleeping. <laughs> One point that was brought up by the earlier comment is that a lot of waste is just a product that doesn't have a viable market, uh, that doesn't have a value or identified value. So it's a byproduct that no one wants. So a key issue for classifying waste streams is identifying what the potential market is for a product that no one wants, whether it's stacks of cardboard, it's uh, chipboard scraps, it's cellophane scraps. What are the reusable markets for those and what connections can we make between those piles of cellophane no one wants and uh, a profitable use for that? And I think that's one of the key classification challenges is making that connection. Yeah. I think um, just to like not be facilitate for a second and ping in, but um, 
I, I had an interesting experience a number of years ago in Thailand um, when we were working a bit and learning from people who um, do scavenging as a, um, as a way of life to make money. Um, and, you know, here a lot of that in the U.S., I think people think about um, metals and things, you know, scrap metal, and there's money to be made there. But um, there it's actually, um, uh, they make money collecting bottles and plastics and selling them back to the recycling plants, um, which is something I think like Matthew and a couple other people here have mentioned a little bit that the U.S. has tried to do, but it's almost an entirely separate sub-market um, in Thailand. And where, where I was um, in the northeast uh, um, little of the province of uh, Khan Khen, um, they really have trouble there with um, the landfills being too too large and that they um, the city actually is going to have to eventually put a lot of money into making a new landfill. Um, but the people who do waste collecting and scavenging as um, for, for their life and, and their income, um, they're actually saving the city a ton of money um, in diverting all this waste. So eventually, you know, they're really like putting off a lot of, a lot of, um, yeah, like they're, they're, they're saving the city a lot of money yet as, as, a, as a group of people, they're actually not really recognized by the state government um, in terms of like healthcare and, and um, having access to education like a lot of other people are, or, you know, are considered sort of basic human rights. Um, so, I mean, just kind of a little bit interesting there. Um, and I think that sort of transfers a lot. Um, there was another group that did like a similar sort of work in India, um, working with people who do waste collecting. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's a global alliance of waste pickers. Thanks, Pablo. <laughs> so, who probably know more about this than I do. But um, it was, I mean, it was really incredible the amount of um, materials that they were, they were collecting from the city every single day. Um, and selling back into the system. So as a side story. So um, one of the things when I was talking about earlier about loopholes um, and waste classification, I'm thinking of trying to think about examples. Um, have you guys heard about the Santa Susana Field Laboratory um, a nuclear uh, accident? It's one of, you should look it up, it's one of the worst that ever happened in the United States. Um, that soil that is radioactive comes to a class three, which is considered to be a, a non-hazardous landfill. That cleanup waste comes to a, because of its beneficial reuse classification, it comes to a neighborhood of Latino people. And um, that's where that cleanup effort is essentially just being moved to another community. And it's being labeled as something called beneficial reuse. So that is a better example. If you look up the Santa Susana Field Laboratory, it's one of those stories in the United States that hasn't really been told. And um, that cleanup is still happening today. And it's one of the things that we have trouble keeping um, as advocates, we have trouble tracking where that soil goes. Is, is all of that going to Chiquita? Is it also going to Sunshine Canyon landfill nearby? So that kind of stuff, I, I feel like if, if there is, um, if we're going to advocate, I kind of feel like we shouldn't be advocating for better yogurt cups or this or that. We need to be advocating for better regulations. And uh, one of the things like, why are you calling this radioactive soil beneficial reuse? And why are you putting this in a community of people? So things like that, that's how I feel like the waste classification system is not, for me personally, in my experience, it's not helping us at all. In fact, it, 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 it hides things like that that come into people's lives. And um, we have a rash of people that have cancer, including thyroid cancer, who live in um, right next to the landfill. And mm -hmm. I, you think about how that is correlated to the policy of allowing this waste to come to this community. So um, maybe that's a better example, if that makes sense. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, I, I don't know if I uh, understand it right, but uh, what Sarah just said reminds me of, um, uh, so th there's a, there's a, a city in China called Guiyu. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of workers doing the, um, the, uh, the work just, uh, um, what, what's just, uh, e uh, yeah, e-ways to scavengers. They just pick up those uh, hands. So, and the, the government put a regulation because there's a lot of people get sick and uh, because of they, they, they are doing this. And uh, so the, the government put a regulation to say, okay, you people, you, you, can, uh, you cannot do this. This is it's not allowed because it will hurt your body. But the, the local workers, they, they don't like these regulations at all because they can make money in this way, even though they know that, that they are, their house will, uh, will, will, will get hurt. They, they, they know they are, um, but they, so they, so nowadays after the government put that regulation, okay, you are not, not the, the, uh, the workers are not allowed to doing this. So they doing it uh, very separately. So the business is still going on. But the worker earn a lot of uh, earn much less money than before because of the new regulation, and their house are keep hurting. I mean, because they are still doing this, just they are doing this harder than before because now they have regulation, which means uh, their job is illegal. But in old days, they're they're legal workers, but now they're illegal. Uh, I don't know. It's just, wow. but they have to do this. They survive in this way, kind of. So. Um, there was a, another kind of interesting one down here in Louisiana um, with the, I mean, with hazardous waste, where um, the community of Brambois, which I don't know, maybe a few of you have heard me talk about or just online, um, they've been accepting waste from uh, oil processing and all kinds of different other hazardous waste into a facility right in, in their community. And not like the community has been accepting, like the, the plant there, which is right on a river. Um, and it's, it's kind of crazy because, I mean, everything that's there is incredibly, like it's this filmy open pools of toxic sludge uh, that you can smell from miles away. And it's just like makes your whole sinus cavity burn. Um, it's terrible. But one of the really like crazy things to me is how the city, or, or sorry, not the city, like the, the community, they can take this waste in, but it's actually like, in one state, it's illegal to transport in, um, and in another state, it's, you know, you have to do this other kind of processing, and it just, just seems really, the regulations just don't seem very streamlined or, like, consistent. Um, and I was wondering um, if anyone had any any thoughts on that or, like, with other examples of, of cross-state lines, um, boundary issues in terms of waste. I worked on the first um, sludge plant for New York City, which is essentially raw sewage, uh, gets pelletized uh, here and then was shipped out originally to Texas Indian reservations uh, because they were exempt from a lot of the federal um, hazardous classifications for spraying of um, urban sludges on agricultural land. So that's just an example of a loophole which was uh, contained within the environmental regulations for uh, Indian reservations in Texas. It, it has since been changed, but originally in the 1990s, that was the scenario. When you flushed in New York City, the industrially contaminated sewage sludge would go down to Texas Indian reservations because of a loophole in environmental um, land uh, spraying applications. So it's just an, exa an example of some of the cross-state um, management of waste flows that needs to be addressed. Now, now that same sludge goes to Florida and gets used on citrus groves. Yeah, it's depressing. Yeah. 
There are also some um, some examples of interesting state relationships regarding waste. I was um, I was at a conference where there was a presentation on uh, this issue with Kentucky, um, or sorry, no, West Virginia, uh, a company in West Virginia, um, uh, trying to send uh, hazard or radioactive waste, um, radioactive solid waste, um, <clears throat> to uh, Kentucky. But Kentucky has a relationship where they only will accept radioactive waste from Illinois. And so this like company in West Virginia set up like a ghost company in Illinois to route through there to then be able to go it in the landfill in Kentucky. Um, because they wouldn't have accepted it directly from West Virginia. So those sorts of like really odd state relationships also kind of play into um, some of these regulations. Cool. And Mike has just dropped a link into Crack Tracker, who I guess has a map of waste landfill transfer stations. Uh, between Kentucky, Massachusetts, and Idaho. Actually, Michigan. I apologize. I went. Uh, I, I think I got my abbreviations wrong for the states. I apologize to anyone from Michigan. <laughs> but you know, just as you were just really saying, like you know, these relation. If it, you know, if you take a look at the map, this is like kind of like you know uh, a first dimension of the data. Like you know, this problem of geospatialness, right? It's like you can have these multiple transfer stations sort of, you know, from us, from an overall picture, they look like they're just arbitrarily traced. But then when you look at, let's say, states between like Indiana, Ohio, you know, they share something like the Wabash River. And what you, what's really interesting is that along that river, um, there's about like, you know, maybe eight or, you know, like close to six of these, uh, of their, you know, registered landfill sites on one end, and then in two at the end of Ohio, and it's like, it's like this one thing that I I would say is an interesting geospatial problem is like how do you how can we sort of like think of what are the other data sets that we need to know, especially for the advocacy side, to kind of like present the problem in such a way that is so compelling that it ties in geospatial like issues, not so that we're not just seeing it just from an advocacy side, but you know, we can tie it in to sort of the socioeconomic conditions in a, in a such a cohesive, met, like comprehensive argument. And, you know, to me, this is like, you know, where like the open data practices and major cities come into play because this is like the raw material that you give to places like University of Michigan, Indiana State, and like a lot of these, uh, you know, data hungry, you know, students, at, especially at the undergrad level that want to have like a meaningful project. And to me is like, this is the one way of like, how do you kind of like, you know, present the problem, you, you know, you can, you can have a, like a hackathon or a datathon. And then you, I, 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 I guess for me, it's like I'm always trying to figure out like, you know, how do you kind of like ride that momentum? Like, you know, as, as, as you know, questioned earlier. Mm -hmm. and another example of that is I was at a paper factory once and there was a huge pile of sawdust in the back of the factory waste from the paper process. And I said, what do you do with the uh, sawdust? And um, they said, oh, that we give it to the chicken factory next door. And I said, why? Oh, they take the sawdust and they spray liquid nutrient on it, huh. and that's chicken feed. So what happens is there is a relationship between a waste stream and a production unit that needs a particular kind of waste. So a open data exercise is really to do some contour mapping or generation right. mapping of these different classifications of waste and to do some join the dot exercises for where they need, there may be opportunities for synchronicity. And uh, a typical one of those is organic or paper waste, uh, which can be used for bioethanol generation. And so New York State had a whole exercise where they were trying to map bioethanol generation capacity in terms of population uh, waste streams of how much green waste, how much paper waste, how much organic waste was being generated uh, so that we, you could identify cost-effective location for bioethanol plants, for example. So a lot of waste there is really about miscommunications of data. If you know where stuff is and where people want it, that, that is a big open data challenge for people to work on is to actually map all those micro points and then 
that blob of data then becomes a meaningful value. That's another advocacy point too, is, is advocating for in your local uh, municipality where you live for your city to uh, inventory their waste in a better way. So I'm working on a project where I'm mapping 10 counties, the Southern California counties, and a lot of the information is available on Cal Recycles database where um, they put everything in different waste classifications. And you can see, hopefully try to get a pattern of how, uh, just an idea of how many times a waste moves based on their total trips and so forth. Um, but different cities have different reporting requirements and just, you know, advocating at the city level and telling them that they need to um, inventory the waste allows a researcher to come by later and maybe identify patterns or better methods. And um, I don't know, that, that to me seems to be where I, that's where I've put my energy in um, that type of thing, advocating locally with local government officials. And um, yeah, that's, that's my two cents. Pablo has dropped another resource in the, um, in the chat um, about a collaborative map for mapping based infrastructure in Cambridge, um, which sounds useful for some of these projects that we're talking about here too. Thanks, Pablo. Um, so we have about eight minutes left in open hour officially <laughs> um, for the open hour. Um, and I think one of the things that sort of struck me through this whole conversation is there's sort of like a dichotomy of questions that are going on. Like on some side we're talking about um, classification being a good thing because they, you know, I think like I came into this conversation thinking that, you know, because it helps us understand and analyze like where things are coming from and where they're going. Um, and making sure that if something's actually hazardous, we know that when we get it, um, even though like loopholes and all that. But uh, one of the things that's been interesting, I think we've talked about here is that they've been a hindrance in many different situations um, to have classifications for different types of waste. So that seems like one interesting like dichotomy and I, I would be interesting in, for maybe a minute or two to think a little bit about what if not classifying the waste, then what, then what do we need to do if that's not working? Um, and then another really interesting one that came up was it, this question of um, do we focus on the consumer aspect or do we focus on like the waste production aspect and then do we focus on the industry or do we focus on people and the individuals? So like it just it seems like there's all these different things that we could choose, you know, one side or another, but I, maybe in the last couple of minutes we should explore some of these things about not what exists, but what, what we think might make this situation all better. I think, um, so this is Mike, I think Sarah hinted uh, what could be the first thing because she's, you know, I think the work that she is doing and like kind of where you like, like have to focus your efforts, it's not really going into like advocating just for the classifications, but like a, an ecosystem, right? A system where you have responsible stakeholders, you have people to be on the ground and to take, you know, really buy in of what these hard is this waste will are. And to me, from what I've kind of experienced being an open data the practitioner is that classifications is really geopolitical. It's to the benefit of those can actually can make it either commodity or serve a certain constituents. Now, I think the next step is really to be effective is like, you know, do you, do you not, you know, do you make actually classifications be part of a classified system? Like, you know, does a system of recycled plastics and et cetera exist in like system one or that, you know, when you do certain kinds of hazardous medical waste, it exists in system two rather than, you know, to kind of treat them as sort of the, you know, effects that they are, you know, how do you rethink them of the communities that can, they can affect? And that, that takes a lot of, I think, community groundwork to like get the people, right of people invested, you know, putting, you know, adjacent, you know, business such as, such as hospitals and medical centers against those communities that they live against. And it's kind of like a NIMBY thing, right? <laughs> and so do you get beyond the saying, not in my backyard to saying like, you know, Hey, over my fence and let's talk. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
you, uh, could you uh, go over like the other second question that you were thinking that was happening in the string of our conversation? Mm -hmm. um, so one like was potentially if if not classification system, then then what? Um, what would be better? Because um, it seems like maybe it's really not the best thing. Um, and the other one was sort of the dichotomies of who um, who is who do we focus on when we're talking about the waste stream? So do we talk, talk focus on the industry or the people, or do we um, focus okay. on production or the recycling? Yeah, Sarah. I have a thought about that, and I th I think really the more I delve into stuff like this, um, the more classifications are great. Ideally, we have 40 and anything that was auto shredder waste would go only in the same truck. You know, anything from like LA, Los Angeles Harbor, LAX, it all gets kind of sorted and then mixed and then resorted. There are all kinds of waste sorting facilities. Every time there's a new trip, that means there's also more air pollution. So all of these policy issues I've found are so complicated that it seems like the solution is really just source reduction. It makes so much more sense to me if you, instead of trying to clean up a mess, is to try to constrain, especially how we package things. But that all has to be done on municipal levels, including any type of enforcement. It, it, in California, enforcing waste classification in the county of Los Angeles is very, very difficult because we have so many different reporting agencies and the water board is control of this waste and another person, Cal EPA, does this classification of waste. It makes it really muddy in terms of trying to get a big picture. So my, my point is, was essentially you know, we either get really serious about waste reduction and try to put our effort in something that's actually going to make a difference. You know, we don't have a lot of time to fix this, you know, our waste issue and, and, and climate issues as a result. So I, I would say my takeaway, I, I think, is always waste source reduction as much as possible. Well, Pablo's dropped something else in here. Um, it says, I share an, another project that um, they made a demo back in 2012, the Waste Packaging Index to measure the waste we buy every day. Um, and he's expressing interest, there's a link in there, and there's interest to brainstorm about the future. So it's the Waste Packaging Index is packaging divided by the total weight of the product. Um, and then he also says to focus on industry and help people reduce and understand a good resource is recycling reconsidered. And there's a link in there as well. I'll grab all these links and throw them in the archive for open hour. Well, we have just about a minute left um, and I'm always keep the line open, but I, before we sort of wrap up, I do want to say thank you so much for everybody who's come and uh, it's been a great evening here or a morning for you maybe or afternoon um so thanks so much for, for um pinging in and uh, if anybody has any any last comments or whatever i'll leave the line open but just type. thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Uh, I wanted to share one it, it's not you know not maybe as important as some of the others that have been shared but uh there's a like a group of restaurants uh, in, in in our area called Clover, and they they do like all compostable, you know, packaging. Uh, and they went to some lengths to do that, including like there apparently weren't like compostable coffee cup lids available, so they actually managed to get a company to like make a new product, which is a compostable coffee cup lid. Um, uh, I don't know how many people here are as uh, bothered when you get like one of those lids and you really didn't need one. Although then you get coffee, hot coffee delivery fingers, but that's okay. <laughs> okay with that. Um, but like, you know, I'm sure we're all like detail oriented in similar ways. We're all on this call. Um, but I really appreciated that they did that. And then they, they actually, <laughs> thanks Liz. They, they put up this post um, that, that was sort of sad. And it was about how um, they had found after some, uh, some time that the they, they pay quite a bit to get their all their everything that they hand you in the restaurant is compostable 
every single object. And so that they only have, they don't have a trash can, they just have a compost bin. I mean, that's not that radical, but it's a chain and they do it for the whole chain. And it's the scaled up sort of thing. And they found that their composter wasn't composting, uh, despite the fact that they pay quite a bit more. I mean, they actually pay quite a bit more to get all of their waste composted, as you can imagine. And the, the composter couldn't even tell them how long they had not been doing it. Uh, and it just sort of, it was outraging to a lot of people in a, like, a, obviously, you know, we live in a pretty privileged place where we can get outraged about this, this particular scenario, but it, it's a very important thing up and down the stream, you know? And like, uh, it made me think like, when you put something in a trash can, like everything or in like the toilet or whatever, everything about the waste that we interact with, everything about the interfaces is designed to obscure what happens to it next. Like the lid on the trash can where you sort of glimpse it for a moment. Exactly. Exactly. And I think your example is sort of like the uphill battle is that, you know, people that have the money, these, these large companies that can, you know, pollute, like when they fail environmentally, they go like, oh, okay, well now we're going to be sustainable. The problem is with us is like when we fail at something sustainable, we don't communicate that as, you know, this is something that we actually learn that we really need to redesign the user experience to inform people of how to recycle. I like to rethink of what it means to put something out there and I think that's like I think I think somehow we have to figure out in the messaging and communication of like these discoveries that these failures are actually really really valuable they're a valuable resource of how, like how to rethink and I think that that's our disadvantage we don't get to fail enough when it's on our side but when it comes to someone we catch oh all they got to do is like do a little bit of one percent of what we do <laughs> and that's and that's the problem so something that's that's the thing that needs to be <laughs> Our failures are actually seen as successes because now we have this newfound knowledge. Okay, now this is what we know we need to change. This is what we've learned. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Anyone else? Some last comments or questions or anything? Well, I have one thing and that is that a landfill I always describe it as a unplanned chemistry experiment. <laughs> it is. That's really what it is. And if you're separating waste, you have better uh, control over what those chemicals, how they'll interact and if they can be reused or you can compost, compost them or how, how, what, where those atoms will go down the road. So yes. Advocating for more classification is always good. That reminds me of something, um, I feel like I heard of the Gretchen, which is like green chemistry, which is seeking to like do all the testing on how um, materials interact and like get a few materials that are actually safe and then use them at industrial scale instead of having like individual factories just invent stuff and never test them and then release it at scale mm -hmm. and then everyone running around and cleaning up. But like there is a group, like there's this green chemistry um, group that's trying to get ahead of it. And I wondered if any chemists had um, any point of view on that. That's really interesting. Liz, do you have a link for that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can find one. Um, yeah, I think I, I met them through Gretchen though. What, one comment I can add uh, to that is there's this really nice project called MIT Trash Track where they yeah. take all the contents of a garbage can and they map uh, where it goes uh, after it is put out of your door. And what's surprising is your trash is a global phenomenon. That mm -hmm. trash plant can explodes into a star that covers the whole globe. And by the same pattern that your shopping cart comes from everywhere, these waste streams have gone from local to global. And one mm -hmm. of the key challenges is to take those waste streams and try to shrink them back to smaller sizes. And for example, all the green waste that comes into your home, if it never goes back out through your front door and only goes out to the back door of your garden, you have substantially shortened uh, those flows. And that is a sort of one of the key classification challenges is how can we shorten the trip uh, from production to consumer to recycling and what are the intervention possibilities there? and the obvious one is just toss your apple core out through the back door window and 
you don't. And so that's like a very simplified example, but. Oh my God. <laughs> also rats. Okay. <laughs> Compost the rat. I don't know. It's very much, much more. The rat will eat it. <laughs> There is one startup here in Brooklyn that I've talked to called Industrial Organic that is trying to do like a food waste solution that's for cities. Oh, so that it's like less smelly and like, you know, actually workable. Wow. That it can be um, processed like in town versus mm -hmm. take shipped off somewhere far. The, the Buenos Canal awesome. Conservancy won a Brooklyn. public budgeting yeah. A grant to do precisely that. They collect restaurant organic waste by bicycles, they bring it to a salt lot next to the Bonds Canal, and we have now one of the largest uh, urban composting operations in the city going on uh, precisely on the precept of trying to shorten the waste streams. And it, most of the green restaurant wastes are perfectly fine. And, and I'm going to ask a question about yes. that. That's not, with the ultimate objective to reduce truck traffic and therefore air pollution, right. you right. started handling waste locally. Is that right. it? Yes, uh -huh. yes, yes, yes. And again, a lot of the debates are about the cost of land. And in this case, where you have abandoned industrial lots, uh, where those land values make sense and you need, you can put composting as an interim use, it makes economic sense. But a lot of the waste stream. Uh, classification dynamics have to do with money. How much does it cost to get rid of something? How much does it cost to process something? How much does it cost to collect it? And New York City suffers from a problem of what we call creaming, where all the good waste is picked up by the early morning recyclers, the aluminums, the polyethylenes. Those are those guys you hear rattling in the garbage cans in the morning. That's all the stuff that's worth money. And those are all important things to work with. Those are not necessarily negatives. We know that certain aspects of the waste stream are profitable, others aren't. And how can we classify you know, one type of waste so it gets subsidized for pickup by the more profitable type? And I think the earlier example Matthew gave about Sweden where we'll take the products back to the shop where it's kept clean and remains profitable, um, that's sort of one of the key doors out of this dilemma. Because most of our trash in New York City, we go through all of this effort of sorting it, it all gets squished into one big truck anyway, in the end, and then just goes to a big incinerator out in uh, Newark. And uh, so the key question is, is how can we keep the stuff separate and profitable right at the front end? And, uh, there, just a plug for another organization um, that's here in New Orleans, it's in Massachusetts and a few other places and cities as well as you were just talking a little bit about restaurant waste. Um, it's called Community Plates and they work um, to sort of close the loop between food that could be actually used but won't be used by the restaurant, you know, in the amount of time that they sit there. <laughs> It's like the sandwiches that were made in the morning that are going to get thrown out at night. Um, and they're big, what they've seen is that actually the disconnect from people being able to use that food is the transportation from the restaurant or from the market to <coughs> it. So they use drivers in the community to go around after like a place is closing for the night to collect the food to bring them to homeless shelter. Um, so that 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 won't go to waste, but more driving. That's another trip for the waste in the waste stream or the supply stream. There's always, I mean, that's its first trip, but you can't think of it that way. It's better for, the, for it to happen with one trip where it gets eaten. Yeah. And let's face it, the waste from that goes either in sewage or a septic tank. <laughs> Rather than it being shuffled or food waste and green waste is the most noxious waste in a landfill. It's the smelliest, it's the worst, it's also the most dynamic because it carries the most amount of water. So um, I think programs like that are fantastic. I'm just looking at their site right now. I think that's probably my biggest lesson from the last you know, few discussions is that we can't really think of like the uh, of, you know these like this ways that this these waste sites really as just sort of like singular objects on a map that you know the way we should be really truly mapping these are like larger like lines of systems 
because, you know, I shared that map recently of just like all the states and where they were reporting, like, you know, these are these landfills. But if we really to really truly map their nature and their impact, all of those little points would have so many branches that would either connect each other or show like point of origin of what's coming into there and what, you know, main arterials are taking and how much of an effect on the neighborhoods that they have to go through. So maybe that's also part of the culture change is that these are not just thoughts on the map that happen, but they're actually these arteries that are constantly evolving and happening. And some are getting worse by the, you know, by the day. And waste can also regain value in the future. There is this wonderful series by Hayao Miyazaki called uh, Komuna and Son of the Future. It's like set in 500 years from now. And uh, part of the industries are pirates that go raid landfills to recycle products that are within the landfill. So landfills become these sort of asset cores that are used to recycle now unavailable products like plastics. Wow. We may still get to that point. <laughs> All right. Well, cool. I think that was a fun note to end on. Cool. Thanks for hosting, Stevie. Oh, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Stevie. Bye. Well, y'all have a good day, good evening, good wherever you are. <laughs> Not See, only in morning in China, it's tomorrow. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, and we're getting a request. Can somebody drop a link into the film? Uh, uh, for Conan, Son of the Future, yeah, I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, we'll get it. We'll keep our Zoom open until we get all our links in, like from April 2. Okay, cool. Thanks. No matter how long it takes. Yeah. How long, Jeff? How long? <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll stop recording. <laughs> all right, we can all say what we really think now. <laughs> <laughs>